Nebraska Preschool Initiative and their PDG program is VPI Plus, who leads their implementation support. And really, almost a year ago when we first met, she had an interest in talking to others about coaching. And then I saw her in late September, and it reminded me that I um, that we still had quite a, quite a lot of uh, questions and uh, wanted to again engage with you all. This will really be a pretty informal conversation. After we do some introductions, uh, we will turn it over to Anne, and she's pre presented some great, uh, great slides and, and questions for you all. I would ask that you mute yourself when you're not speaking, and I know fo folks are in teams, which we really do appreciate, uh, just because of the background noise. So let me see. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, today we're going to go over some quick in introductions. Uh, we have about seven state teams and then some of our staff. Uh, set a very brief context um, for what is job embedded professional development, why is it important, a little bit about best practices and some selected examples. And the bulk of the call will really be led by Anne talking about um, Virginia's approach to uh, coaching and what she's learning uh, and some questions she has for you all about how to best support coaches in uh, in their work and improving practice at the local level. And there's a very good recent report to share. We will talk at the end about some next steps. We will have to end the call a couple of minutes before 3, because the line is booked at 3, so we're going to get a little, um, we may have, we'll want to end right then. So what I'd like to do um, actually is go to the introductions, and I'm just going to really uh, kind of call out uh, state teams. So I see that uh, Jocelyn's here from the Massachusetts team. Just give us a quick context, Jocelyn, about who you have in the room and uh, anything you might want to share right now about what you'd want to learn. Uh, Anne has embedded some questions in the PowerPoint where we'll get much deeper into that. Okay, great. Hi, um, this is Jocelyn Bound from the Preschool Expansion Grant team in Massachusetts. and. Um, Donna Trainum, who is work collaborating with us um, on the Department of Early Elementary and Secondary Education, is also on the phone. And unfortunately, Sarah Volkanot, who is our professional development specialist, was supposed to be joining the call, but she did break her ankle over the oh, weekend, no. so we are down a person. Um, but one thing that we are thinking a lot about is in our, we're working with five communities um, in implementing the preschool expansion grant. And each community has its own um, plan for PD. They're providing, working together to provide PD. A lot of the coaching comes from the public school, but the programs are being run by EEC licensed agencies. So there's some cross-agency work happening there. And then we're also trying to think about how we can support the coaches and the instructional leaders across our five communities. So really, I think a place where our mind is in, is in terms of what's the power of building on those networking opportunities, and what's the best way to support the coaches in doing their work locally. Thanks very much. Jan, I just sent you a note um, that if it's OK with everyone, we are going to record the call. There were a number of folks who were not able to be on it, and they're really interested in this conversation. So I don't know if you started the recording already, Jana. I did, Lori. It's been recorded since you started. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, uh, so I see Carol Blanchett uh, on the line, and maybe you'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, yourself and, and your state team. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, my name is Carol Blanchett. I'm the Chief for Teaching and Learning here at the State Department in Rhode Island. And um, I have Allison Comport from our team with me on the phone. Allison, are you there? We're not at, we're not in the same room, so we um, yeah we're kind of small, so we have to spread the wealth. But um, really interested in um, this job embedded PD and the whole early childhood, um, third grade, you know, birth to grade three sort of initiative. Our our governor has um, noted that as a as a goal to have 75% of all third grade kids reading on grade level by um, I want to say 2025, and you know a lot of early uh, initiatives, and just really interested in in what you have to offer, and to developing some partnerships and and being part of a network. Allison, I don't know if you want to add anything. 
Well, thank you. Actually, um, we are going to have a lot of time to actually engage in, in a deeper Very discussion. Good. So um, we'll we'll save that for a moment. A moment. Great. But I do see um, Deanne uh, Gostello from New Jersey. Would you like to just uh, give a quick shout out to your team and any particular goals or learnings that you'd like to be sure where we talk about today? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Deanne Guastello from New Jersey. Um, I'm a preschool expansion liaison, and I'm with our director, Beth Gardner. And um, we just wanted to just kind of learn some different approaches. We do have some specialized roles in our uh, program, the master teacher, as well as the preschool intervention and re referral team. Um, and they both uh, take a, a coaching approach. Um, so we just wanted to join the, the call and learn um, the systems that everyone else is working on. Perfect. Thanks so much. So I see the Early Childhood Center of Professional Lear Learning, Megan, Susie, and Cindy. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, we're uh, actually the state of Illinois, and we provide statewide professional learning for all the preschool for all uh, grantees as well as the expansion grantees. We are currently supporting this year 49 programs in expansion and we have had a coaching program in in process for our preschool for all programs that did not meet the quality standards that we have for our quality rating improvement system in the state and we are trying to transfer some of that what we've learned from that to the expansion grantees as we support those instructional leaders. So we're just on the call. I'm here. This is Cindy with Megan and Susie, and we're just wanting to see what other states, we're interested to see what other programs are doing to support those leaders in expansion grants and development grants. So anything we can learn today, we would appreciate it. Great, and I'm sure you're going to share as well. That's fantastic. I think I skipped over Dorothy Tate from the Virginia team, uh, I'm assuming. So Dorothy do you or, or Mark, do you want to go ahead and, and introduce your, your, your folks? Uh, good afternoon. Sure. We are here to support Ann. We, we'd like to claim <laughs> Ann, and we're behind her all the way. I have a team of folks here with me. We have a brand new coordinator for our, for our program, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Kastner. I'm the coordinator for VPI Plus at the state level, but I've been serving on the VPI Plus team this past year as the data analyst. And so I'm taking over Mark's role as he's on to some new projects, and he'll be joining us here in a few minutes. He will. I'm Cheryl Strobel. I'm the Associate Director of Early Childhood Education, and I play a role on the VPI Plus implementation team um, aligning uh, what the federal program is doing with the state initiative. Thank you. Putting uh, your mute on, that would be great. And then Harriet, I see your name, and I imagine you have the Connecticut team with you. Yes, hi, Lori and everybody. Thanks for um, hosting this. Uh, I'm Harriet Feldlaufer with the Office of Early Childhood in Connecticut, and I'm here with um, um, folks from our Quality Improvement and Support Division, as well as our Early Care and Education Division. Michelle Levy is here, Deb Fliss is here, Deb Adams is here, Laura Dunleavy, Mel Camacho, and our new QIS Division Director, Jennifer Johnson. Uh, Connecticut's had a long history of coaching. We started a project that we called Training Wheels back in 2008 for our state-funded pre-K, and now we are currently using a coaching model in our uh, PDGR um, grant. So we're interested in learning from other states and also sharing what we've learned in our variety of um, strategies that we've used over the last decade. Thanks. Uh, thank you. That, that's great. Yeah, we did notice that. Now, I see a Kimberly here, and I don't know exactly who that is, so perhaps um, Kimberly could introduce herself and her state team. Kimberly, I don't see you're on the phone, so hopefully Kimberly's on the right call. <laughs> Kimberly? All right, uh, we have some staff here, Jana, Martella, Jessica, who's going to speak in a minute, Hammond, uh, Shannon Ayers, I see as well, and Sue Mitchell from the AEM uh, TA team. And as we get into the discussion, I'll ask them to just use that time to go ahead and introduce themselves so we can uh, get right in to the um, to the content here. 
Oops, really quickly, uh, I wanted to just give a really a context for, sorry, I think we might be having, all right. Really job embedded professional development has grown in uh, kind of the, the, it, the research support and the understanding. It really reflects how we really as adults and children learn uh, when it's grounded in our day-to-day -day teaching practices and it's designed to really focus specifically on instructional practices. So it's a really a narrowing, I think, of the focus and an embedding in what we do every day. And I think this applies both to um, adults and kids, actually. What I've noted in that uh, this, this understanding or this definition of job embedded professional development really supports alignment both across the sectors and I think an opportunity to connect first to third grade um, as we, again, we've learned more about what type of professional development is effective and sustained, uh, collaborative, intensive, data-driven, classroom-focused, again, is the most effective professional development. And this really aligns with uh, the new goals uh, in the in CCDVG for developing a framework of professional development, discouraging the funding of one-time training and Head Start and Early Childhood Special Ed. So I think we have a much better understanding of the research about how to define a, a professional development in a way that is going to change teaching practice and support children's learning. There is some results from research that job embedded professional development is more likely to result in a change in instructional practice and improved outcomes for children. Granted, a lot of this work is, is correlational. But I think that's going to be the job of our field to continue to get stronger and more nuanced research. And I think that undergirds this call. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Hammond. Uh, Jessica, if you wouldn't mind giving, uh, I'll, I'll move the slides for you, but give a brief background of yourself. Uh, Jessica is new this summer to uh, Near and CELO, coming from the field. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica Hammond. I'm as Lori said, new to near. I have um, taught for many years in Massachusetts as a preschool teacher and actually worked with Donna on um, previous things going on in Leicester, Mass. And then I also was a school administrator in Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, so I'm excited to have both Mass and Rhode Island on the call today. Um, and this is something that's really dear to my heart is the GEPD because there's so much that I think that we can learn from it and so much support that we can provide to teachers. Um, so some of the best practices in job embedded professional development are facilitated by school-based instructional leaders um, and that ensures that we're providing relevant, coherent, continuous professional learning and improvement to support our, our staff. We want to make sure that job embedded professional development is collaborative and within community as that provides a catalyst for learning through support and change and routine for sustained support ensures that professional learning opportunities are occurring frequently and they're also sustaining supports for improving teaching and learning. Inquiry based is providing facilitate is facilitating the construction of knowledge support problem solving and really supporting the needs of our teachers and looking to solve problems and things that are relevant in our field. Uh, we want to make sure that job embedded professional development is structured. We're looking at clear and measurable goals. We're looking at ensuring that it's evidence-based practice frameworks, that it's real and relevant examples, that we're looking at what the issues that we're dealing with in the field and in the classroom in our schools. And some things may be specific in particular to each individual school. Um, we want to make sure that we're when we're developing, when we're working on job embedded professional development, that we're also using norms and protocols to ensure that we're using respectful sharing and examining of practice and making sure that our discussions are focused and we're identifying specific practice improvement steps that we can be building upon our goals and objectives. And with anything that we're doing, we should be evaluating, looking to see what we're doing right, what we could have done better, and how can we improve on that. Those are some of the best practices that I've found in looking at the job embedded professional development. And then through looking at this, I found some state examples, and I've, we've provided the websites there as well. We looked at what Alabama was doing and their reflective coaching model. So they find that to support the first class pre-K teachers as part of the PDG. 
And the reason that they did that was to improve quality of support and school readiness. And their PDG funding expanded the reflective coaching models, reached over 100 additional classrooms, or nearly 2,000 more pre-K children. So they have about a ratio of about one coach in every 15 classrooms. So in Illinois, I know we have Illinois on, and I'm sure that you could do a better job at this um, since you're currently in the field with it. Um, but through the ounce of prevention, they've developed the PDI in partnership with the Chicago Public Schools and Chicago Department of Family Support Services. And there are there's a, really a plethora of information on the ounce.org website relevant to this. And the Texas Early Learning Council published the Partners in Action, which is a toolkit for early childhood providers. And that toolkit provides 14 tools for administrators and mentors, such as checklists, planning guides, application forms, assessments, and observation planners. And those are all online on their website as well. So I think there's a lot of information out there. Um, and I think supporting each other will help us build upon our own practices. Thanks, Jessica. We'll continue to share uh, resources as we continue, and I think that can be an outgrowth of this call. So I am really excited uh, again to introduce Anne. Uh, hold on, why am I? Oh, there we go. There's a picture of Anne. <laughs> really engaged. I've had the opportunity now to be out in Virginia when they bring everybody in to look at the data, and I was in a session. Um, in September, as I mentioned, and Anne was leading it really with with the coaches. Uh, and one of the one of the comments that really stood out to me is, um, you know, last year I was worried about really learning the coaching model. This is what the coach said. But this year, I really know how long and how hard it is to change teacher practice. So I'm, uh, you know, looking for new tools to really engage, um, engage with with teachers and change practice. And and Anne leads um, both this th that coach and and many others um, using data. So I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and I'm going to give you the controls, Anne, so that you can. Let's see, hopefully that worked out. All right, and you might as well go ahead and get started, and I think that'll happen. All righty, there we go. Okay, I did it. <laughs> All right, thank you. thank you so much, Lori, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I'm so excited to be um, having some contact uh, online with folks from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Illinois, Connecticut. Um, and for those of you in Illinois, I do have to do a little bit of a shout out. Um, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, and so I'm extremely excited for the Chicago Cubs to be in the World Series. Um, Illinois team, you guys feeling good about that? Yes, Absolutely. we are. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so people who live in Chicago and are Cubs fans know how long practice change can take. We're talking a hundred years. Uh, hopefully, this is. Hopefully this is the golden year where the Cubs win the World Series. But in any case, we'll celebrate the changes that we've had <laughs> on the way. Um, so let me try to click to the next slide. Okay, so my name is Anne Lospital, and I, um, I come from the University of Virginia. I'm going to try to click through this slide. I work for the Center of Advanced Studies of Teaching and Learning. And it looks like the slide is a little bit caught off. Oops. Can I back up the slides? Uh, let's go. Let's go previous. Sorry, guys, I'm giving you a, a preview. Took a second to catch up with me. All right. Sorry about that. All right, so it looks like my slides are cut off a little bit, but that's all right. Um, so I am with the University of Virginia Center for Advanced Studies of Teaching and Learning, and we provide training and technical assistance as part of the oh, this just changed as part of the Virginia Preschool Initiative Plus project. Um, looks like oh, there we go. And uh, we in the VPI Plus project, uh, we are working with 11 school districts uh, around Virginia. You see the little. Um, a little map of Virginia down there. And across these 11 school divisions, we're providing support and training to 15 coaches, just to give you a sense of scope 
And I don't know the exact number of teachers that they're working with, um, but I can tell you that the caseload varies quite wide, widely. In some rural divisions, we have a ratio of like one coach to two or four teachers at minimum. And in the larger divisions, uh, you know, places like Richmond, um, we have a much higher ratio, and, and we've been trying to support coaches to define their own caseload so it's manageable and they can differentiate their coaching by teacher need. But that's just to give you some context. I'll move on. So what support do we provide to coaches? Um, so we are in year two of our implementation. I'm not sure if you all are in that place or not. I, I noticed that Connecticut's been doing coaching support for a long, long time. Um, but at least as far as this grant goes in our relationship with these coaches, we're just beginning our second year working with them. So in our past year and then in our upcoming few years, um, we are contracted to provide twice a year trainings. Um, I'm also about to visit all my coaches around the state this month. And then every month we have ongoing support through individual and group calls. And we've been playing with the format of those group calls. For instance, last year we had group calls with all of the coaches and they presented on um, case studies and we supported them with that. This year we're trying different um, formats and different content focus to try to promote more engagement and give them more of a leadership role. So for example, this year um, coaches are doing a social emotional group and a math focused group and they're taking on um, they're defining the, the focus and content of each small group call. Um, Practice-based coaching, I say, is our general framework. Um, at Castle here, we've um, done some research, or at least my colleagues here have done some research on a coaching model called My Teaching Partner. Um, we see practice-based coaching as a framework that really defines what are the key elements of coaching. So you see the image up here, for those of you that aren't as familiar, it basically defines that Coaching must, ha um, must occur in the context of a collaborative coaching partnership um, and that within that there's a regular coaching cycle that must always include shared goals and action planning to define what practices or practice a teacher and coach are working on. Then a teacher and coach, um, there must be a focused observation in which a coach observes the action plan being put um, being displayed in the classroom, and then it's followed by reflection and feedback. Um, we say it's a framework because, number one, it doesn't define the exact teaching practice, um, and unlike maybe a curriculum for um, kind of a metaphor, a parallel process for a curriculum in a classroom, you'd expect that there'd be a scope and sequence of exactly how a t teacher would deliver the strategies. We think in the same way that practice-based coaching still allows quite a bit of flexibility, which we'll talk about, I think, over the course of this call is both good and I think it allows for many coaches to apply this in their different contexts. At the same time, it also doesn't provide the specificity or definition of how intense that coaching needs to be. Um, so what I'm saying here is that practice-based coaching is the general framework um, on which all of our coaches are trained. However, this year, we think this is a great thing we're excited about. Some of the divisions have opted to use their funds to purchase coaching models like My Teaching Partner, which is focused on teacher-child interactions, a Pyramid Model, which is focused on social-emotional strategies, um, also PAS, which is um, coaching around a social-emotional curriculum. Um, so just to throw that out. Anyone have questions? Just need for clarification at this point, or I'll move on. I'll give you a second. All right. And everything I talk about today, just introducing um, what we're doing in Virginia, I'm hoping that it will be supported by our annual report. I've pulled out an excerpt from our annual report about the coaching, as well as what we're doing in Virginia, and Lori said that she'll put that online for you all. So I'll go through this super briefly. Okay. I'm clicking here. Okay. Um, so, okay. It's a little bit of a delay. So this is my first question, and I think many of you uh, who just introduced yourselves said that this was pretty much your main reason for coming on this call. So I, I agree with you. I just want to know what coaching support looks like for you all. Um, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to try out that fun little chat, chat box on the right side of your screen. And if you could answer these three questions. Um, first, 
how many coaches are part of your preschool expansion or improvement program? Um, two, how or kind of in what format are you supporting your coaches? Um, I'm wondering if it's similar to what we do or different um, training, visits, calls, or some other way. And number three, are your coaches being trained um, either in a, I say, a coaching model, or it could be a framework. So are your coaches learning practice-based coaching, um, you know, which comes from the National Center for Quality Teaching and Learning? Um, or is there another particular coaching model? Um, for instance, in Rhode Island, I was curious, are you guys having a, is there a coaching model around literacy-specific content? Um, we just love to know what that model is. So if you wouldn't mind, um, and you could either answer in, in three sort of text, or you can just write a longer chat and just put, you know, number one, two, or three next to your response. Um, and if you could also put your state in it, so just put like Rhode Island, number one. Okay. All right. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to do that, and then maybe we can do a little summary. Well, I'm seeing only we only have two, you know, two responses so far, but I do kind of see this seems like a ratio of five co about five coaches to ten classrooms um, between Massachusetts said ten coaches, forty eight classrooms, and Connecticut said uh, I think you said similar to fifty five. One coach. For, oh, there's Dion. Oh, so oh, good. So Dion from Hawaii is on now too. Just so we know that. Um, just to keep it moving, if folks would say a little bit about their model, I think that might be really interesting to know before we move on. Like, if you have a particular coaching model. I see Harriet in Connecticut typed in a, a nice response. So coaches are being trained in a hybrid model, cognitive coaching, which I believe gets at kind of the, there's a difference between the structure and process of coaching. My understanding is that cognitive coaching is big on um, sort of training coaches on the skills for communication, um, which I didn't mention, by the way. We've been doing practice-based coaching, but some of my background is on motivational interviewing. So I have a real interest in bringing in basically communication strategies that coaches can use intentionally to get teachers to um, kind of uncover motivation that's within teachers versus sort of telling them what to do or convincing them how to change their practice. Um, so that's interesting, Harriet. And then also instructional and transformative coaching. So I don't have um, much background in that, but I would love to, Harriet or anyone else who has a coaching model, if you're willing to share any references for that or um, you know, online or articles, I'd be really interested if you're willing to share. Good idea. And we'll ca we'll capture that. We're going to try to capture all the notes in the chat, too, and uh, I think it's okay, okay to move on. Okay. All right. And I see Jocelyn looks like there's local provided training. So I'm wondering what kind of, what that might look like. So we'll, maybe you can share in the next um, sharing opportunities. Okay. Trying to demonstrate good impulse control here. It takes a little delay to click. If I start clicking multiple times and I get taken too far in advance, hold on. Um, okay. Um, so just a summary. Um, last year, how did it go? So just a, uh, a couple um, summaries or basic statistics for you all. Um, in the springtime, our 15 coaches worked with hundreds of teachers. I don't have the number off the top of my head. But on average, um, teachers had about 11 hours of coaching in the springtime. The frequency with which um, coaches met with teachers was quite variable, um, partly, I think, because of the caseload range that I talked about, you know, anywhere from two to maybe 30 teachers. Um, but also, there was, 
I think in part because there was so much flexibility with the framework, um, coaches didn't have necessarily the clear structure in place to determine how frequently they would meet with the teachers. Um, one success that I have below there is that we were supporting coaches to use the data. Um, in, in the state of Virginia, our QRIS collects class data as well as Eckers um, revised scale data. So each of the coaches had reports on, um, on at least a good portion of their teachers' classrooms, so they used that data, as well as child data collected through PALS, which is our phonological awareness literacy screening, and GOLD, um, teaching strategies GOLD. And we help support them to, to plan their individualized PD, their job embedded PD and coaching around that data. Still room to grow, absolutely. Um, I have to mention our coaches were all new to coaching. Um, many of them were former preschool teachers. And so while they had some training in PALS data, the class, the Eckers and Gold were pretty much new to everyone. So that's still been a work in progress. Now um, all of our coaches are class trained. So that's been an area of PD for them. And finally, I'll say one area of success for year one in Virginia was that our coaches got together through these uh, through these trainings and through these monthly visit, monthly calls, I should say. And so they really started to form collaborative partnerships, relationships with each other. Um, and this year, I think the learning communities are, are being built even more. Um, so that's been a success. So next, what I want to show you, if I can get to the next slide. Laura, if you wouldn't mind clicking for me. Is that going to work? I'm happy to, okay. yeah. It seems like okay. it's annoying for you to do it. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. It's just a, it's a delay. I'm sure there's the technology right. is working hard. Right. Is this the right slide, Anne? It is. Okay, great. So at the end of year one, um, our teachers took surveys, and part of the survey was around their perceptions of coaching. So this is um, I'll, these next two slides are slides that I showed our coaches in our September training, and so I just wanted to show you what we showed them. Um, so click on it again, a little circle will show up. The first two items, which really relate to teacher-coach relationships, um, you'll see it will be circled in green, 92% of teachers agreed or strongly agreed with these statements. So our message to coaches was, wow, this really means that you've set good collaborative partnerships in year one, and that's such a great foundation going into year two. <laughs> the next slide shows the, um, and click again, Lori, the bottom two items, uh, or actually the last item. I have changed my teaching practices as a result of coaching this year. Um, if you click on that, you'll see that 24% either disagreed or strongly disagreed with that statement. Um, so what we did is we asked a question that I'll, I'll also ask you all. Click to the next slide. Why is it that why is it that fewer teachers are reporting changes in teacher practice? We've got over 90% agreeing, wow, I really like my coach, really comfortable, we have strong relationships, but then a, at least a quarter are not reporting practice change. So this is what we were reflecting on. I'd like to take an opportunity to have you reflect on that. So click to the next slide, Lori. If you wouldn't mind, don't be shy, either um, type into your chat box or even, or even shout out <laughs> into, your, um, into your phones. Um, Take a moment to talk with your team and think about why this may have been the case. And if there's any factor that you can identify that might apply to your state as well, why maybe more teachers aren't reporting teacher practice change, or maybe if you're collecting data, why teacher practice change isn't <laughs> happening for all teachers, to share at least one thing that you think may apply to your state as well. And Lori, feel free to jump in. If you would recommend that they chat versus talk, I'm open to either. Whatever is comfortable for folks, either use the chat or just go ahead and shout out um, whatever you all feel comfortable doing. Or, but I think this is this is really the crux of our challenge, isn't it? Um, your data is so powerful, and I, I remember when I was there last uh, in September looking at that. And it's. And it's all the data that we have to go on so far, so far, really, because in last fall, we had QRIS come in and um, 
our, our partner, Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, they collected QRIS data in that fall. It's not until next fall that they'll collect that data again. So it's really hard for us to gauge really change in teacher practice, let alone child outcomes at this point. So really the best data we have, as we see it, is just the teacher report data. So anyway, I'd love to so hear I'm any hypotheses. Cindy, um, Cindy from Illinois, uh, your team, just because you've been doing this for a long time, are you seeing, um, you know, what's the rate of change in teacher practice that you're seeing? Is this surprising to you or similar? What you're We're saying. talking here as our team, and this is not surprising to us. While we've been doing it for a while, this has been a learning process for us as well. I am new in this position. I'm the director of the program. I've been with the program for about a year and a half. Megan is uh, also new to this position, and Susie's been working with the coaching project for about the last, well, she's been wor working with the coaching project since it was initiated. But through Susie giving us feedback, as Megan and I just came on board with this project, Susie was giving us feedback, and we had a lot of extensive conversations about why we did not see change in practice. And we think it was because it was very difficult for our coaches, they were mostly preschool teachers and administrators before as well, to go in and have the teachers set the goals. It was, they were telling them what needed to be done. Our state uses Eckers. Chicago, the, well, Head Start uses class and, and CPS uses um, class as well. And Eckers, they use both. But for the rest of the state, it's basically a compliance checklist for the grant and Eckers are. So we were seeing that while they might get a better score in Eckers, when we would visit a site, we did not see substantial changes in practice. We have just instituted that practice-based coaching model this year. It's kind of a hybrid. We've interjected concepts from the coaching with powerful interactions because Megan and I attended some uh, the NACI PDI and some other um, professional learning conferences, and we were finding that states that use that approach were getting some better results. And that's because we think that approach does focus on the the teacher actually setting the goal. So a, a coach could walk in and see a lot of things that needed to be worked on and try to set those goals. But having the teacher identify the goal is what we're, so we're basically in our first year of trying this particular framework out. And our, we gather data, we get, um, we're gathering data about the goals they're setting and the, uh, what, what types of goals are being set, what do they relate to in terms of Eckers and their compliance on the grant, but it's more than that. It's, I think it's them internalizing the process, I mean them, the teachers, of the problem solving, of having those problem solving skills and looking to others and we're very interested in setting up some type of like community between these teachers so that they can go, they can work together in a community to solve these issues, to reflect on their practice and so forth. And prior to that, as I said, I think a lot of it, I think it's very hard for our coaches, I don't know if Ebony Wells has experienced this, to actually have the teacher set the goal and try to guide them through the process of looking at resources, how do you use resources and so forth to be effective. So instead of it's the telling, it's the teaching them the process that they use. Yeah, there's oh. a nice uh, mm -hmm. conversation on the chat which supports that and also you made me think about this of the teacher setting the goal, so the teacher acknowledging that that this is a behavior they want to change or they, you know, have identified that feels like that's very aligned with our theoretical description of job embedded uh, professional development, that it is something the adult, you know, understands and wants to change. Uh, uh, Harriet raised some good issues also about the time it takes and the mental models about teacher beliefs and then attitudes and then practice to you know, the time it takes to change. So um, I think this has been a really interesting discussion, one that we want to kind of keep the thread going in as you go ahead and, and move forward. But um, I don't know if you had any other reflections seeing the chat. Wow, yeah, this is awesome. I, had, I, I was listening so intently to what Cindy was saying because <laughs> it was great and it made me think, oh, wow, that sort of goes along with, I think what you're saying is you think that coaching interactions could be improved and I think it 
there's a parallel a little bit in what we're trying to do with the motivational interviewing. Um, and I'm going to look into the coaching for powerful interactions to follow up. Um, but I see also in the chat there's some really great ideas, and I feel like I can't quickly go through them, but I'm going to read through them and follow up with you all. And I guess the ideas are so good that I'm hoping that we leave this call with like some follow-up time for discussion. Yes, <laughs> and we this definitely is will. I think we really tipped it, but Shannon also sh Ayers shared in the box something really, in the chat box, really important about a study that they conducted at NEAR in New Jersey, and in, this was in kindergarten though. Uh, but then when they um, moved towards ensuring central office support and administrator support, then they saw some changes in classroom quality, but it did take two years. So I think that's another yeah. really important factor. And yeah. this is Cindy again. I just wanted to interject one thing that my team reminded me about, and Susie was writing leadership as a big word, and just what to mirror what Shannon and echo what Shannon was saying is that when we visited programs and we could see that the, it did not transfer to practice, it was usually because the administrator was not involved. So we are looking at a whole leadership track in terms of having leaders, the, the administrators, well, we try to get them on board in terms of the framework and so forth, but we're looking at, you know, how do their administrators support them in this? And um, we also, as a state, are adopting the Learning Forward Professional Learning Standards. I don't know if you're familiar with those seven standards. And the leadership component is one of them. So we're looking to that as guidance as well and, and how they support that transfer to practice. Thank you. Really helpful. I'll make sure we, put, we add the Learning Forward Standards, but that is a very important source. Okay. Can, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Yep, exactly. It works out. Okay. Okay. These are some of the ideas that coaches had in the in the training. I won't go in depth. You can just see them. I think initially I interpreted it as a little bit of a defensiveness initially, like, uh, I don't know if this data is correct. Um, although I saw in the chat box someone had a comment that it, it really could be how an item is worded, the extent to which a, a person might agree with it versus not. Um, that said, as researchers here at CASEL, when we see a percentage, you know, a quarter of folks disagreeing that they've changed their practice, we assume that observational methods are even more rigorous. So we'd assume that likely if this is inaccurate, it's not, uh, let's see, it's a liberal um, judgment, not a conservative judgment of how many teachers have changed. Um, the, I'll just say that the, the last two items, or I say the last three items, are ones that we felt like were in the realm of control. Um, in other words, things that coaches could do differently and things that we could help coaches do differently. So let's go on to the next slide, Lori, because it kind of relates to what, um, what I'm doing. So, to make this move along a little bit quicker, yeah, go to the next slide. Really where we are now at CASEL is thinking, what can we really do to make coaching as effective as possible, to change teacher practice enough as possible, so that's really, we see measurable changes in practice as well as child outcomes. So if you wouldn't mind, I think people had great um, great ideas shared on, on the chat box before. Would you give at least one recommendation from your state um, maybe it's something that you've done before that's been helpful, and just give a little bit of a detail about what you did that was helpful. That would be a great start for me, and I'm sure for other folks. Um, Harriet, um, I also didn't get a chance to look up, but I had read in your APR that you were evaluating your coaching model, and I didn't know whether you had any data back, um, you know, that might suggest any improvements, and I don't mean to call you out or anything, but just I know I, you were the one uh, that I happened to see that was actually evaluating it, and you may actually have addressed this with the training wheels uh, coaching model. So. 
if you want to either share that verbally when you're ready or in the chat box, that'd be great. Hi, Lori. This is Deb Adams. I've been sitting in Harriet's chair for a little bit, typing oh, away. Okay, hey, Deb. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, we did uh, evaluate our uh, coaching pieces uh, for the preschool development grant, and um, we're in the process of uh, reviewing a lot of that data, and we did show um, actually high levels of satisfaction with our coaching model, and that's because we're using sort of a coaching plus model, looking at their literature around it's not just the coaching itself plus the leadership pieces in the context of the environment, but also looking at um, professional learning communities and uh, from a base of inquiry. So when coaches go in and observe and work with um, teachers and teacher assistants, what, what I wonder questions come up? What types of things can we build off of to develop a professional learning community that actually makes it more meaningful and relevant when they look at their own data and then go back in and coach more? So um, we've been playing around with that sort of um, model. It's not just a coaching model, but it's also a coaching plus. Uh, what other mechanism other than, say, trainings or calls or uh, webinars, but actual um, professional learning communities. And we've been running some of them actually regionally with other programs, so peers can learn from peers as well. Um, but uh, I could probably summarize a little bit of the data for you at some point and uh, pass that along. Sure, whenever that report's ready. But um, I didn't know if anybody else wanted to share. Uh, while I'm, while we're waiting, I was in Minnesota last week observing their, they have a principal leadership institute where teams come of early childhood teachers and curriculum instructors, but they also have an online course that is focused only on actually communicating student communication how to use language to engage students in their learning. And it isn't only for pre-K, it's pre-K to grade three. But as part of that online course, and there's also a, a model where they're, you know, they're, they're meeting in person, but they take video. And she showed me a video of really where they tried out this new method, um, what, which was taking out all the chairs and having uh, kids do writing with, with like, I forget what they called it, oh, flexible seating. Anyway, the use of video, which I know Anne's going to end up with in a minute, um, is very, very powerful. Uh, I remember m many years ago, I was working with uh, teachers in New Mexico. We would be videotaping their teaching. And one thing we did is that we never said, oh, you're doing X, Y, or Z. We showed them the video and let them evaluate what they were doing and what they wanted to improve or what they noticed. And we also found that that was, that was the most powerful and changing practice. When the teacher looked at their own video and identified it, the practices they wanted to change. So I'll just stop there and let others, uh, or Anne, if you want to summarize any comments and uh, see if there's any other ideas. But the use of video, I think, is very powerful, as you will learn with my teaching partner and other strategies. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested, really, to learn more. Um, I'm reading a lot around, you, you know, bringing in leadership, um, getting leadership and administrative support, and how how important that is from your perspective. Um, so that that is something I want to look into more. I think in in our experience um, so far with the grant, we've had pretty good success in engaging the the local teams, um, but what I've learned already is just how complex school systems are, and that you know if you have a few people in the room, you may not have the people in the room who make some of the decisions, those big decisions. So trying to get engage more leadership, including school uh, administrators, all the way up to superintendents, is something that we're looking at improving over the next couple of years. Um, but I do, I just want more time I'll have to sit with the chat and, and review what all is in there. Um, so I want to quickly, you know, we don't have much time left, I wanted to quickly summarize our approach so far. Basically our, our plan to try to improve um, coaches' effect effectiveness um, to change teachers' practice. I see this as a kind of two-pronged approach. One is to improve how coaches focus their coaching and click again. The other part is their intensity. I guess it didn't show up on that slide, but you see it here. I have very specific recommendations. Um, these align with the CASEL annual report 
um, the excerpts of which are going to be placed online by Lori. So I won't go into any of these in great detail, but I'll let you browse these a little bit, um, and I'll kind of overview the focus first. Um, so I think our, our initial reflections on year one, um, looking at the action plans that coaches had with teachers, looking at the PD plans that they had with teachers, that there was pretty often too diffuse of coaching focus, that coaches were trying to focus on many different things at one time versus focusing on a very specific thing based on the data and having an ongoing focus. So that's been a very big push for us. Um, also, the, the point about coaches getting some expertise in content areas, um, you know, the limitation of doing practice-based coaching or another framework is that it doesn't necessarily give coaches the deep knowledge within a content area, whether it's literacy, teacher-child interactions, working with kids with disabilities, that they need to build those foundational um, knowledge, uh, that knowledge base, we think, to maybe focus a little bit better with the teachers. Um, I already mentioned the coach learning communities. Um, when it comes to coaching intensity, we see that as two different things. One is that um, it, sometimes it's the most basic things that are important. <laughs> uh, I realized in supporting coaches over the year that many of them didn't automatically set schedules with each of their teachers. And, and once I gave them that advice and once we set the expectation that they meet with their teachers at least twice a month in meetings and twice a month to observe, um, I think starting year one, there's a lot better structure in place for that to happen. Um, and the leadership, at least within our VPI Plus program, we've shared our recommendations and really encouraged them through calls to protect coaches' time to do the work. Um, what Lori just referred to, I think, is the, the bullet that's third from the bottom right. Um, so we, here at Castle and University of Virginia, we've done a lot of um, projects that include incorporate video. Um, video modeling is teachers watching exemplar videos of practice and we think through research that it's really important for teachers to observe the practices versus just learning through that through writing or hearing about it and to analyze those videos. We also have learned that it's very important for teachers like Lori just mentioned to review their own classroom videos so we're making a recommendation to coaches to make sure that those two things happen at least on a monthly basis. We're trying to support them for that to happen. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Lori. Um, oh, looks like these are just disappearing for some reason. Sorry about that. Okay. That's funny. There's um, something weird about the <laughs> PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Probably my strange animations that I didn't mean to do. Um, I just wanted to show to kind of put into a play. People were making fun of me yesterday and saying, oh my gosh, I'm like the I'm like Princess Rubric. I love rubrics. Um, <laughs> I think that's a strategy in and of itself. Every time I meet with our coaches on our monthly calls, they've been submitting a, a case study and we go through this rubric and and look at specific behavioral indicators of how well coaches are focusing and, and providing intensive level of coaching support. And then I get them to reflect on their plans for improving focus and intensity. So just to give you an example of that, um, it's something that we're really trying to be better at implementing this year um, and hoping that that makes a difference. Lori, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, we're, we have very limited time left. Um, I did want to, this is sort of a catch-all slide. These were other things that I just would love to hear more about, really have more an in-depth in discussion um, with you all about any of these things. Um, so you're welcome to comment, maybe chat in your, put in your chat box, any reactions to these things. You know, are you facing similar issues? I think uh, at least Connecticut, or was it Connecticut or Illinois was saying, um, yes, it takes time. No, oh, in Illinois, no, it's not surprising to us that teachers aren't unilaterally changing practice. But any other reactions or, or resources that you want to share with me, I'd be so grateful. Um, and then, Lori, could you go on to the next slide? It would be great if folks would talk, you know, in their team. And I yeah. um, think what we can do in the closing in the last few minutes is talk about how, if there is an interest, we can continue the conversation um, either with, you know, both with another call or with possibly sharing a contact list so you can just chat with each other. Um, we'll, many of us will be seeing each other at the grantee meeting. 
So um, maybe in a, let's let the team speak in a minute, you know, talk to each other for a minute and see if there's any um, anything folks want to share. I, I let the other people know for the other call that I was going to be five minutes late, so we're, we're not quite so pressed for time. I'm in particular interested um, around the data that anybody else might be collecting. I think you, you presented a lot of great data and that, again, is both how we spur and incent you know, change in either teacher practice or our own practice. And I think having that data is really, really powerful. So I'm curious whether any of the other states are collecting data. I think. Uh, Deb mentioned that you were collecting data on satisfaction with coaching, but what kind of data we're, we're taking, you know, you might be collecting on change in practice and how you're triangulating that perhaps with class we data. Have, data. We also have other surveys uh, regarding change in practice and beliefs as well. Okay, change in practice and beliefs is great. Um, I'm going to put on our, uh, on our, on our webs. we will post this and I'm going to put additional resources. We have a really good discussion guide that both identifies tools that look at the teaching conditions. And when we've done some work at CELO around this uh, through, through another project to improve teaching and learning, and one um, you know, major factor is the, is the conditions, both the structural and the process conditions, to implement good practice. And this could include things like time. You know, is there time in the day for teachers to come together? Is there data that has been analyzed at some level that could be given to them in a form that they could use? Uh, and I'll put that guide on there. It identifies a number of the tools that have been developed, um, including the five essential survey uh, from, from, uh, from the OUNCE, uh, as well as work from uh, the Early Childhood Workforce Survey from Marcy Whitebook and others. But What's nice about it is it crosswalks domains and it's a discussion guide, so it actually may be something helpful for you all. I'm going to move to the next slide and see if anybody else would like to share. Hold on a minute. Was that it? Oh, okay. So here, um, did anybody else have any other? Well, please note any resources either in the chat box or any follow-up. And if you wanted to say a little bit about the video clip directory and this new website. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we have a new website, um, just went live uh, at the end of last month. It's vpiplus.org right there. And I wanted to share with you two resources that you all might want to use because they're national, freely available resources that we're trying to help coaches use to improve their coaching and help improve teacher practice. Um, if you go to um, the website and click on VPI Plus Resources, this video clip directory will show up. I just have a little screenshot for you. What it allows you to do is it's a searchable um, directory and it allows you to select different content area, um, whether it's interactions, social emotional areas, inclusion, dual language learners, um, content areas like language literacy, math, it allows you to search by those content areas, and then it gives you other information like the sources. But um, we're really excited about this video clip directory, and, and as part of the action planning that coaches do, we encourage them to identify clips that relate specifically to the practices they're working on and having coaches and teachers discuss what's happening in those videos. Um, there's also, when you go to the BPI Plus resources, there's also other different kinds of resources that are searchable. Um, our experience has been that there's no shortage of amazing free online resources. The problem is, one, that it's sometimes hard to find them, even within the site that you're familiar with, and two, it's hard to find things that really align well to your needs. So we're trying to do a better job at that. Um, so I hope this is helpful to you all. And we would definitely like to improve it with your input. So if you have any resources to add, for instance, you know of a great, um, great online source of video clips um, that show early childhood um, evidence-based practice in action, then please let me know. I'd love to add it to it. Really quickly, I, don't, I didn't look yet, Anne, but the Colorado Results Matters uh, video 
library is really fantastic. I don't know if you if anybody has used that. Yeah, now is that I'll, I won't make I'll make it super brief. If that is video clips of children's behavior, we would include that on our PD resource but our video clip directory is really designed to be teacher practices in action? Yeah, I'm not yes. sure. I think that that is a really good question and I will look okay. it up. I don't know the answer to that, so I think that's a good question. Um, okay. I want to take this opportunity to, to thank um, you all for joining us today. Also, thanks so much, Anne, um, really for raising this issue and presenting um, really good kind of problem practice data that she has there. Again, we will post all the materials on our website under the PDETA tab, and you'll see that there. We'll add some additional resources. Please be in touch with us, and I'll send a follow-up uh, to see if uh, you'd like, we'd like to have another call maybe in a couple of months even to continue this conversation. Um, we'll try to check in with you at the grant team meeting. But, um, and Lori? I'm sorry to interrupt. If you wouldn't mind, if everyone's okay with you doing a contact list, I know at least I'm really interested. I may not be able to make it to the PDG meeting, but I'd love to get back in touch with folks that shared today if it's possible. Sure. So if anybody could let me know if you do not want to be on the contact list, and I will create a contact list so people can reach out to each other. And I may have to be in touch with people to just get the right contact person, but <laughs> I have the, the person who said they were going to be on the line, so that would be great. Please let me know if um, there's any other way or let your TA lead know this won't be the end of the conversation. Really rich discussion today. Um, again, thank you to Jessica Hammond as well for joining us and sharing, um, and we, we really look forward to continuing to raise this issue. Thank you again. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.